A very good evening to one and all present here. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all present here. First of all, I would like to welcome you all in this online lecture series for MA Part 1 students, jointly organized by VEN Government Institute of Arts and Social, Social Science, Nagpur, JM Patel College, Bandara, Rajkumar Kivaramani, Kanya Mahavidyalaya, Nagpur, RS Mundle Dharampet College of Arts and Commerce, Nagpur, Shri Binzani City College, Nagpur, and Mahila Mahavidyalaya, Nagpur. Before we proceed further, I would like to introduce today's resource person, Dr. Pranjali Kane, ma'am. I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Just a minute, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dr. Pranjali Kane, ma'am, is an Associate Professor in the Department of English of Sri Bizani City College, Nagpur. She has a teaching experience of 14 years at UG level and 8 years at PG level. She is a recognized research supervisor with five scholars working under her guidance. She has recently submitted her minor research project sponsored by ICSSR and had many research papers to her credit. I welcome you, ma'am, on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much, Bhavna. Over to you, you ma'am. Yes, thank you so much, Mamna, and uh, good evening to all the lovers of literature. We are all students, and I am also in the process of uh, learning things. So uh, it's a it's a privilege. I'm very proud to be associated with this group. All our colleges are, uh, you know, into conducting this online, uh, you know, lecture series, which. Uh, includes all the sessions on the units of the MA papers, the first semester paper, and likewise, uh, all the, the background courses, the uh, topics are also going to be covered over here. So at the beginning, let me thank the organizers. And uh, for the students, I have divided today's lecture into three different parts. The first part is going to deal with what drama is and the types of drama because uh, this is your sec the, the second paper and the first unit. So we start with the Renaissance drama. And uh, uh, so it is, you know, we'll see what drama means because this as a genre, this is a very different kind of a thing with something that you did in the first paper that was connected to poetry. And in this paper, we are all going to deal with drama. In the first unit, you have got as detailed text study. For that, you have got Dr. Faustus, which is written by Christopher Marlowe. In the second unit that is going to be held on 25th, you have uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. In the third unit, you have got As You Like It Again by Shakespeare. And in the fourth unit, you have William Congreve's The Way of the World. So uh, all the four units are uh, uh, based upon the drama section. And so it is my uh, basic duty to tell you about what drama means. From there, we move on. To the background topics and background topics for this paper you have got four background topics uh, starting with what renaissance means then the origin of drama and then to the university wits after that we come to the detailed text so three sections uh, is what i am going to target in this uh, one hour's lecture let me take you uh, share my screen and uh, let me take you to the i hope this is visible can anybody just confirm? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, great. So we the name of the paper is English drama from the Elizabethan age to the restoration period. And I take you to my first slide that is what drama means. So if we look at what drama means, drama is a performing art. As we all know, and you can see, uh, you know, there are two faces, the masks which are uh, being shown on the screen. One of the masks is smiling and the other is feeling sad or crying, just the opposite. So whatever life has to give us is depicted in this form of art, which is drama. So naturally, it is going to be a kind of a fictional as well as a non-fictional 
combination of events which that uh, is brought to us through the dialogues so in a in a novel when uh, uh, a novel is written or a short story is written an autobiography or a biography or any other form of or in a poetry also it need not be based upon dialogues there can be simple descriptions with minimum dialogues into it and the whole meaning is conveyed to the readers but in a drama the description is missing description is done through the various dialogues which the characters speak so you need a plot you need a structure you need some characters uh, sometimes it is uh, a single character also is enough for uh, 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 this kind of a presentation and you need an audience before which this whole uh, a stage is built and this whole drama is presented and that's why it is called the performing art okay now if we go further these are the types of dramas which uh, we are going to deal with a few of them uh, there are tragedies there are comedies written tragic comedies historical plays problem plays realistic drama poetic drama epic theater theater of the absurd and you have n number of experimentations going on in the 21st century also in different areas i mean not only in the english literature arena but also in the indian languages the indian uh, stage is uh, very fast developing they are bringing in all sorts of different types of dramas also but for our purpose because we are going to deal with elizabethan literature and uh, till the uh, the next part i mean the 100 years that we are talking of we are going to concentrate upon the tragedies comedies more okay now uh, a quick revision of what i said just now the background topics which we are going to deal with is the renesa i'm just going to hint at what renesa means the students are requested to go back and uh, research on this topic because it's a vast topic uh, the english renesa is different than the italian renesa that uh, uh, you know the italian renesa is where the origin is but the english renaissance also to a large extent has retained uh, uh, the spirit of renaissance so we are going to talk about renaissance then as i told you about the origin of drama which has four parts that is the mystery miracle morality plays uh, on one level at one level and uh, the next level is the interludes and the fourth is going to be your university wits and one of the university wits is uh, christopher marlo so the detailed text study is dr fosters now if i take you to what renesa means as i told you it comes from a french word meaning rebirth rebirth renewal so this re this prefix re tells you that something that was earlier there you're bringing it again so it is a kind of a discovery it's not an invention so it's a discovery of what was there in the classical literature you bring that forth in the uh, in the next uh, maybe a few centuries after this so that is a renewal of something okay so if you look at the characteristics of renesa it was a period of european cultural artistic political and economic rebirth following the middle ages roughly speaking you can, we can term as renesa was between the 14th and the 17th centuries now this was all upon the classical knowledge that was there in literature arts sculpture architecture all these areas uh, were affected by renaissance now as i told you the english renaissance is very different from the italian renaissance and there were many dominant art forms uh, uh, specially connected to literature and music in the english renaissance part now what happened in england during this renaissance there was certain change that took place and what was this change this change was uh, a kind of a humanitarian spirit i'll term it that way that a humanitarian spirit actually came up into the uh, the knowledge domain so all the intellectuals were uh, very much you know uh, excited about what was there in the classical literature uh, can we bring it to this present uh, generation can we read can we spread this knowledge is what uh, renesa meant there was a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, something that uh, you uh, term as the just a second yes uh, 
the emphasis to was given to the regional languages like english french and spanish and uh, not to the classical language basically because the idea was that knowledge that is present should be distributed should be spread amongst all the people and people in general or the commoners their language was english language the even the french and the spanish languages were there so classical languages were not opted for much and the focus shifted from something that was elite or aristocratic to the common man so the focus was on to the common man and that actually uh, brought dignity to uh, the commoners also very important thing that happened during this period was that uh, a questioning or a scientific temper a questioning attitude came into being so if something was told to anybody uh, it was not out of blind belief people wanted to know more and more about what was there in the classical literature so education somewhere had to spread because people needed to read all the books and know more about what was there okay so this was all about renaissance if we go into the origin of drama which is your uh, uh, second topic we had initially the clergymen uh, you know we all know that the churches have these beautiful masses where the text is actually uh, related to the people the congregation the masses you know the people uh, coming together in the churches and listening to some pieces from the bible and all so the clergyman decided that uh, uh, instead of just uh, reading the text and explaining them it would be better for them to perform these uh, uh, you know stories in the form of small skits and uh, uh, they started performing these kinds of uh, plays or i i won't call them plays even they were small skits based upon uh, the passages uh, in the from the bible based upon the lives of the saints the great people and slowly uh, drama form in the in the in something that you call drama now uh, originated from there so these smaller 15 to 20 minute skits became larger pieces and more number of people started coming to uh, the churches and all to see uh, you know that's the audio visual effect so to see what till now they were only listening to so the mystery plays uh, miracle plays and later on the morality plays uh, came into existence so the mystery plays are plays which were uh, based on the uh, biblical stories the miracle plays were the plays which were plays or skits which were uh, uh, actually written on the lives of the saints and later on as i told you the morality play uh, came into existence and morality as we all know are personified uh, you know uh, goodness good and evil both uh, or you know like honesty and uh, uh maybe even um, uh, when you help out other people when uh, uh, peace all these characters were personified and they were used to the you know the didactic purpose was there so they were used to teach the people so they these abstract qualities personified were used in the place to make the people understand if you do good good is going to happen to you if you uh, do something bad definitely karma returns so uh, uh, the bad things uh, will come to you so uh, somewhere the seeds of a, a tragedy or a comedy uh, you know they were sown in this period of time also the fourth thing that happened in after this was the interludes and our interludes is you know as the name suggests that between these uh, two mystery plays or a mystery and a miracle play between these two skits there was certain period of time which went uh, into you know uh, a kind of a, a filler kind of a thing if i have to give you a, a similar thing which happens now in the modern times is when one event takes place the other event takes place between that uh, these two events there is a time lapse and to cover the time lapse also many times the interludes were created some comic interludes were introduced so that uh, uh, people will be uh, entertained people will still remain uh, in the same places and uh, there will be a kind of connectivity to the whole thing so these interludes came into existence so this was how the drama started and slowly the churches could not hold the number of people because people were very interested in knowing what was 
all this happening so these uh, uh, these dramas were enacted uh, in bigger places in the near the market places and all and slowly it assumed a very different uh, uh, setting you know in the in the elizabethan age when the when a theater was constructed for the, uh, these kinds of dramas now if you look at the next uh, topic of your background that is university wits this is a group of uh, writers those who were university educated and they were termed as university wits and it was roughly the 16th century the last 15 years of the 16th century when these stalwarts uh, started writing and uh, there were many collaborative ventures of these writers so you have many uh, uh, writers like uh, thomas lodge and uh, thomas nash coming together and producing a play so you have christopher marlow robert green thomas nash thomas lodge and uh, uh, these writers they were not only university educated uh, they had a different type altogether to present in front of us so out of these university wits we have for our detailed text christopher marlow students are requested to go back and research on all these seven writers and find out the important writings whatever they are known for uh, christopher marlow is what we are going to continue with in the detailed text but the rest of the six writers also you are requested to go back research make your own notes and keep them ready for your examination if you look at christopher marlow's age 1564 we all know william shakespeare the greatest dramatist was also born in this year so both of them were contemporaries uh marlo very unfortunately died in 1593 uh, such records are found uh, pertaining to his life and his death so he was an english playwright a poet a translator of the elizabethan era and he is mostly known for his dramatic blank verse okay so he introduced that dramatic blank verse he established it rather and the famous tragedies by faustus are dido queen of uh, sorry uh, famous tragedies by marlow uh, are dido queen of carthage tamburlain the great dr faustus the jew of malta edward ii and uh, when you uh, when we have a, a kind of a comparative analysis of what actually uh, marlow wrote uh, like the jew of malta or dr faustus we all understand that if you look at his life there are many um, um atheistic references or you know the question mark put on the existence of god in the uh, not in the literal sense but the 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 way the people perceive god as so marlow has a different take on all these things and to, uh, through dr faustus i'm going to take you through the different uh, uh, the acts the five acts which are there and the different scenes also and in the end we are going to discuss uh, do we find any kind of similarity between what we saw in the renesa part like what is renesa and uh, this character dr faustus that marlow has created so i request you to uh, look at dr faustus from that perspective that here is a man who uh, was a german scholar and uh, uh, somebody who was very ambitious on one hand quite uh, uh, how should i put it uh, uh, you know dissatisfied with what he has a lot of knowledge was there around him he was a master of many subjects but somewhere the the need to uh, have more uh, should we call it greed uh, maybe yes maybe it was only a kind of i have all these things i know all these things this is a uh, some kind of limitation is there in this i want something which is unlimited i want maybe power i want maybe materialistic things which are unlimited so i'm reminded over here of uh, leo tolstoy when tolstoy uh, wrote uh, much later on but tolstoy wrote uh, how much land does a man need so there also he says the i mean the 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 meaning is the same what is enough uh n number of x number of uh, money in your bank balance or you know in the in the bank or maybe the powers that uh, uh, people the political power that you experience you enjoy what what is where do you put a stop what is the point where you say that you are really satisfied in life 
that point is very difficult for all of us to understand, appreciate and stop somewhere. So uh, here is a man perhaps who was not well aware of all these things. He was very knowledgeable in the sense that he had information about lot many things. But if you talk about knowledge in the right perspective or if you talk about wisdom coming out of that knowledge, then perhaps there is a question mark. So majority of us are like Dr. Faustus is somewhere. Uh, this is what I felt when I looked at Dr. Faustus. So let us begin Dr. Faustus today. Uh, when the play begins, there is a chorus and the presence of the chorus is going to be in between also, in, in between the acts also. So at the beginning of every act, you have a group of people coming upon the stage and telling us about the setting or telling us about the characters or what we can expect in the coming act. Like we have the Sutradhar concept, the narrator concept in the uh, other dramas also. Here the work is done by the chorus. As I told you, this, uh, this type of writing that is drama has some limitations. You cannot have descriptions and all. And that's where the chorus comes into picture because they are trying to tell you what you can expect, what the setting is. Um, if it is a jungle setting, then the, naturally the backdrop is there. But if any additional information has to be given, uh, you cannot have uh, that in a drama. You only can have it through the uh, dialogues of certain characters. Okay. Uh, along with that, at the beginning, when the prologue is set, the chorus enters and the chorus tells us that this whole story is about Dr. Faustus, a German scholar, and the good and the bad that he actually uh, did in his life and the repercussions of it, the effect of it is what uh, this whole story is about. So maybe the rise and the downfall of Dr. Faustus is what we can uh, expect in the coming pages is what the chorus says. As we move on in the first part itself, in the first act, first scene itself, there is a soliloquy of Dr. Faustus. Now, Soliloquy is a, a dramatic device wherein the character talks to the audience. Now, it's not actually to the audience. The character lets the audience know what is going on inside his or her mind. Now, if it is a novel, we can have uh, you know lengthy descriptions, pages after pages, telling us what the character is thinking, what is going on inside the mind. But when you're performing, how will you let the audience know about it? So, uh, uh, soliloquies were uh, meant to let the audience have a glimpse of what is going on in the mind of the character. So, uh, when there is no one on the stage, the character comes in front and talks to the audience, lets them know uh, what is happening. And uh, the other characters are not present over there. That is a soliloquy. There is another uh, part to this, which is called as aside, when uh, there are multiple characters on the stage and the main character who wants to uh, let the audience know about what is going on in his or her mind or wants to confess something or wants to say something or communicate something or think only in his mind, moves apart from the other characters and says those things. The dialogues are there. Uh, they are not dialogues, they are monologues rather. So monologues are there and the, the people, the, the, uh, the people sitting in front, they instantly understand what is going on. And the character then again goes and resumes his role, mixes up with the other characters and the play moves on. So that's called an aside. This is a soliloquy. And in all the uh, tragedies uh, written in the Elizabethan age, the soliloquies were um, uh, very great parts of or an integral part of dramas. Okay, so in the beginning only, there is a soliloquy in which Dr. Faustus is thinking in his mind and letting the audience know about it, the dissatisfaction that is there in his life. Now, for a commoner, a commoner might not uh, understand if a person is rich, a person is knowledgeable, a person uh, enjoys a, a certain status in society. How can that person be dissatisfied with what he or she has? Okay. But, uh, you know, this is how our character is. This Dr. Faustus is. The more we have, the more dissatisfied we become. Is somewhere 
the message which comes in the first part itself. Now, when Faustus is thinking, he's thinking in his mind and he's relating to the audience, he says that he knows law, he has studied medicine, he knows philosophy and theology. Again, you know, he is uh, very frustrated with these things. He is already a master of all these things. But there are limitations to everything he says. Theology is the science of religion. Philosophy, we all know what philosophy means. Medicine, again, uh, you know, whatever was there in the field of medicine was already known by him. What else? What more? You know, you nowadays also when you make a film, the 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 writers or producers would always think about uh, what different, you know, what uh, you know something which is different than what is shown earlier. So to you know, this quest to show something different takes you to um, uh, very weird kind of settings and weird kind of dialogues and you know the themes and all those things also at times. So uh, instead of you know finding out uh, what more can be there and you know thinking about it and feeling uh, blessed about it, Dr. Foster is having this dissatisfaction and in the first act, in the first scene itself, this is made very evident. Now the only thing which he feels is left to know about is necromancy. And necromancy is the, the world of magic. Now, when magic comes in front of us also, we also, as children, we also used to feel that uh, if you are you become invisible for one day or even for an hour or so, what would you do? And there are uh, so many fantastic things that small children will think of. I'll go and eat this. I'll go and, uh, uh, you know, uh, enjoy uh, something. Maybe the company of my friends or maybe I'll go in a theater and watch movie. If nobody is going to watch me, uh, you, we have the Navratra season going on. So you have the Garba and everywhere the tickets are there. So um, for a split uh, moment, if you uh, yourself imagine that you become invisible, what uh, what is it that you will do? And uh, these kinds of things come in your mind. But for commoners, this is okay. That you wish that, uh, you know, something that you don't do every day, you will do it. But for Dr. Foster's, he was an established person, a man of status, uh, belonging to elite and aristocratic society. He was, uh, he knew divinity, he knew law, he knew medicine. So he was respected a lot by all the uh, German scholars also. So uh, for a person like him to think on these lines again is, uh, you know, one cannot understand that in the beginning. Okay. So necromancy is something which he feels that he should uh, study. Okay. And through necromancy, what he wishes is that he wants more wealth, he wants more power, and he wants more glory. So there's more and less. What is less? What is more? Where one should put a stop to uh, whatever uh, uh, you know you uh, yearn for is another matter which we all should think. Out of this, he feels that that is Dr. Foster is thinking in uh, in uh, in all these uh, in his soliloquy that what he wants to gain is profit. He wants to gain power. He wants to take delight. Yes, happiness. And be wants to become omnipotent. That is all powerful. And he wants to have honor also. So the moment you have more knowledge, naturally people are going to respect you more. He already has but wishes for him. As we move on, there are certain other characters also in the play. And they are introduced at uh, uh, in various acts. But here I have included uh, all these characters. Uh, just to give you a feel of what happens outside Dr. Faustus. Now, this is what Dr. Faustus is about. But there is another character called as Wagner, who is a servant of Dr. Faustus. And um, uh, somewhere, you know, the, uh, the, the master-servant relationship is such that Wagner is a person who imitates Dr. Faustus a lot. So the moment Dr. Faustus has the Cornelius and Valdus, uh, those who are... Uh, uh, the magicians and those who are great scholars also, those who are going to teach uh, Dr. Faustus about necromancy, they uh, come and meet Dr. Faustus 
Wagner also understands that this is what is going on and uh, does the same things that Dr. Faustus does. But there is a lot of difference between Faustus's uh, stature, his uh, abilities, his uh, his uh, uh, you know intellect, his knowledge, his wisdom, and Wagner's. So naturally, there is a lot of difference between them. We also have Rappe and Robin who are stable keepers and those who also uh, want to practice magic after a certain period of time, but they are unable to do that. Because to practice magic also, a person needs to have that caliber, which these people lack. But they are the subplot or the, the, the other strata which is shown in the, the play Dr. Foster's. Now, along with these characters, we also have something which makes this whole play a morality play. And when I was talking about morality plays, I told about the personified uh, qualities. Now, quality is like good and bad, uh, that kind of quality. So there are angels and there are the good angel as well as the bad angel. Now, as the name suggests, the good angel uh, is going to tell Dr. Faustus what are the things which are actually expected out of him, the ideal ones. And the bad angel is going to come, uh, you know, constantly um, attract uh, Faustus in the wrong direction. Now, for the commoners also, like you and me, uh, whenever a situation comes in front of us, uh, the good and the bad angels are there around us. So, uh, uh, you know, they keep on telling us about their own, uh, they have their own ag agendas. The good angel is going to tell us about what we, how, what we should select and what we should do you know, our behavior and our thought pattern. And the bad angels are all going to take us into the wrong direction. We as human beings have to choose either one or the other. And whatever choices that we make, we either suffer because of them or we get benefits out of them. Okay. So these characters, they are going to be recurring in the whole play, Dr. Faustus. Now, the second scene, there are two scholars who talk to Wagner about Faustus and scholars. Um, they feel sad. You know, there are two sets of scholars. The one set of scholars, uh, they are there to uh, teach uh, Dr. Faustus about necromancy, that is black magic or, you know, a magic which is, uh, uh, which has got some, uh, uh, you know, uh, which is dominated by Lucifer or which Lucifer actually, uh, uh, you know, takes you along with him to the the whole wonderful, uh, you know, uh, very attractive kind of a world where you can do whatever you wish. You can go anywhere you want, get anything that you want for eating purposes or experiencing purposes. But at the same time, you, uh, there is a price to pay also. So that price to pay is there in everything that we do. Every choice that we make, we have to pay the price is uh, what is there in our lives also. So uh, this set of scholars, uh, they are very happy that Faustus is into necromancy. But there are other German scholars also, those who feel very bad about uh, Dr. Faustus, a person of his stature, his caliber, his knowledge. Um, uh, they respect him a lot, but he has, uh, you know, he is going down into a, a place which is similar to hell. So they are feeling very sad about the, the condition of Dr. Faustus and they somehow decide that they should inform the head of the university of this development. Like if Faustus is going to go into necromancy naturally, his position in the university because he teaches divinity also, it is at stake. As we move on in the third scene, somewhere now after Dr. Faustus learns necromancy, learns the art of magic and starts conjuring up, calling up the spirits. There is this character, wonderful character in this play uh, called as Mephistopheles. Like you have the Aladdin ka jinn, you know, when uh, Aladdin rubs the lamp and there is a, a, a spirit which comes out of that lamp and says, I have been trapped over here, but whoever has this lamp I'm going to serve that person. So uh, similarly, we have Mephistopheles, who is uh, the agent of Lucifer. And we all know who Lucifer is. You have just uh, done your first paper. So who is the agent of uh, Luc uh, Lucifer? He comes in front of Faustus. And the moment he comes in front of Faustus, 
he looks very hideous, very ugly, and Faustus is somewhere repelled at the sight of Mephistopheles. He says, it, you know, shoes him away, says, go back and come in another form. So that we understand that our physical form, how we look or how we present ourselves is also equally important. Somewhere, I think, uh, half of the impression, whether we are good or bad, people would always, uh, you know, equate it with if we look good, we might be good. You know, that kind of a thing is there. So, Epistophilus CV is looking very ugly, kind of. Faustus imagines, you know, uh, him to be bad. Ugliness, that is, the outside looks, the external looks are somewhere equated to this badness that is there. And if a person is good looking, perhaps, uh, he is accepted. He is rather appreciated in society. So similar kind of a thing happens over here when Mephistopheles is uh, asked to go back and come uh, again in good shape and Mephistopheles obeys because he has to. Okay. Now there is this conversation between Faustus and Mephistopheles and at various points in the, uh, in the whole play, we have this kind of a conversation between these two characters. Now Faustus is a simple person like you and me and Mephistopheles is the agent. So, agent is somewhere trying to tell him through, you know, in a very hidden kind of a way, is trying to uh, show him what he is into now. Because Faustus wants to, uh, you know, he is ready to sell his soul for 24 years of this magical world. This having everything. Okay. Now, there is no explicit reference to why this number 24 has come about. Perhaps it is because there are 24 hours in a in a day. Uh, so, th that's why perhaps it is this 24 years time. And if you look at it from, a, uh, you know, as, as a whole, you feel as if 24 years is a pretty long time. But actually, when you start living your life, 24 years, they rush by like anything. And at the end of it, there is a kind of remorse, a kind of repentance uh, uh, from Faustus itself. Okay, so there are many questions which, uh, in the in the whole course of the journey, Faustus and Mephistopheles are going to be together now for the rest of the play. So uh, Faustus is ask, going to ask Mephistopheles many questions, and Mephistopheles is going, is going to answer Doctor Faustus. The only thing that he does not answer is when Faustus asks him, "Who made this world?" And then Mephistopheles says, Nay, I cannot tell you. This is outside syllabus question. Okay. Because this is against what he worships and he worships Lucifer. So he cannot take the name of God because God has created this universe. So uh, there is this wonderful uh, whole passage also where Faustus asks him, uh, What is hell? You know, what is the nature of hell? <clears throat> and Mephistopheles tells him that. You know, hell is where there is no God. One aspect of it is hell is where you are. If you are going to follow something which is bad, you are already in hell. Okay. So, there is no place, different place as hell. Like even in uh, what we also believe is there is a heaven, there is a hell and there is this earth. But what Mephistopheles is trying to tell him is if you do something good, naturally wherever you are becomes heaven. Because you are near God. And whenever you do something wrong, that wrong can be hurting other people, that wrong can assume a larger you know, uh, uh, proportion also, like you are doing something bad to the society, uh, you are already in hell. So hell is no different place, he says. Wonderful uh, conversation that goes on between these two people. And then there is this proposal that instead, uh, in exchange of the unlimited power that Dr. Faustus is going to get, he will sacrifice his soul. He will give his soul away to Lucifer. And then Lucifer will decide what uh, needs to be done. And Faustus does not think in the beginning that this is something which he should not do. So he is lured. He is attracted to this proposal. And he uh, decides to uh, sign a treaty, uh, sign a bond um, uh, that actually uh, is going to uh, you know, put him into hell. In the next uh, scene, we have Wagner and we have a clown. So these kinds of interludes or these kinds of uh, some comic relief is also there in the play. When uh, uh, Wagner is imitating his master, as I told you that Wagner has this habit of uh, doing whatever his master does. 
So he he misuses his uh, power by calling two devils, just like Faustus calls uh, conjures up and calls Mephistopheles. Similarly, we have Wagner misusing this power and doing it, and we can understand what uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe actually has to say that uh, the the uh, he is here talking about the classes. So the lower class people are always going to imitate the higher class people. In the same way, the younger generation also starts imitating the elder generation. So uh, the older generation. So that's why, you know, when you, we behave in a particular way, we talk in a particular way, there is a lot of responsibility on us because our young generation is looking at us. They are going to uh, do what you do, the way you talk, the way you behave. Your ideologies are going to influence them. In the same way here, Wagner also looks at Dr. Faustus and misuses this. Now this, the commentary is on the social class. The, the humor that is included in this, Wagner and the clown, that is a kind of body humor and uh, which is not at all sophisticated, which is not something that the elite class does. So naturally, Wagner is behaving and even the clown is behaving according to their social class. And naturally, they are involving the audience also. Now here, later on, the contract is signed between uh, Dr. Faustus and uh, uh, Lucifer with Mephistopheles as a witness to this. And we all know that when you sign a contract, there has to be some witness because otherwise the two entities or the two parties which are there, they will, uh, uh, they should have some kind of a legal binding to the whole issue. Now when this kind of a, you know, Faustus is getting ready to sign this contract, Again, there is this re-entry of good and bad angel, evil angel. It is nothing but, by now you must be, you know, must have understood that this is something that you call as your conscience. We understand when we are about to do something bad, that that, that conscience pricks you. You know you are doing that. But then that attraction perhaps is so great that uh, uh, perhaps you lie to your own near and dear ones and go and enjoy yourself. Perhaps you steal something because that uh, something that is there, I mean, the maybe money, maybe position, maybe something is more alluring and you give in to all these kinds of uh, allurements. So that whenever this kind of a situation happens in Dr. Faustus, uh, the good and bad angels come uh, in front of Dr. Faustus and try to, you know, Tell him, they give him a choice at that point, okay? But Faustus actually, you know, he gets lured, he gets attracted, he signs the, uh, the contract with his own blood. And a very interesting thing happens that when he pricks himself, he stabs his hand so that the blood comes out and with the blood he is going to sign. The moment the blood comes out, it congeals, okay? It thickens, Faustus is unable to use his pen and, uh, uh, you know, write or sign the contract. And then there is this kind of a fear in the mind of Faustus. He understands that maybe God does not want him. God in the sense that, you know, it's not the right thing to do. So somewhere he is oscillating between the good and the bad. Faustus is a very, you know, normal, common human being. And as we also oscillate between something that we should do and something which actually is very attractive, the similar thing is happening with him. Okay. But in this whole thing, finally it happens that Foster signs with his own blood. Now, this main question arises why does Lucifer want the soul of Faustus? Faustus wants infinite power, Faustus wants all the materialistic things, Faustus wants to enjoy before his actual death and you know perhaps in the beginning he has this feeling inside his mind do we have rebirths are we going to uh, you know um, be born again or is this the only life that we have so is there a, a life after death all these questions you know the common human beings are always struck with these kinds of questions and there are no answers because uh, you know science has not given us any such answer and uh, so either you believe in it or you don't believe in it, okay? But from Lucifer's point of view, if we, uh, why did Lucifer or why does Lucifer wants the soul of all the people, those who oscillate? Let me put it this way. There are two answers. He wants to enlarge his kingdom. He wants to increase the number. So this is where the 
quantity matters so the more number of people on his side naturally the more power is going to be with him and the second is he wants to make others suffer as he does so somewhere there is this feeling in him he is suffering because of his downfall we all know about lucifer we all know that he is a fallen angel you have studied your paradise lost that's the story okay so lucifer is a fallen angel and there is a big big disgrace attached to him so he is suffering his own death uh, the moral death that we are talking of in the same way he wants the others also to suffer and that's why he is pulling such souls who are doubtful souls who are oscillating between good and bad it is very easy to attract such people you know so so that uh, his kingdom will enlarge okay now after this mephistopheles tries to uh, distract faustus because faustus is oscillating you know and then mephistopheles will uh, uh, you know he is also feeling uh, if faustus decides not to i mean if he goes back on the contract they'll be losing on a candidate and they don't want that to happen so mephistopheles tries to distract him with all kinds of materialistic things the crowns the expensive clothing you know all these kinds of access to riches power you know to have anything something which makes you comfortable something that feeds your ego also at the same time is where the distractions set in is how mephistopheles distracts him diverts his mind okay the fosters takes the book of knowledge now what does the book of knowledge tell him it gives him all kinds of information related to the planets heavens plants earth trees whatever is there in this world but the moment the word heavens come there is another kind of oscillation rethinking oscillating oscillation is what you move from this pendulum you have seen the clock the pendulum okay so uh, you move to this extreme then you move to that extreme again you come to this extreme then you move to that extreme that is called an uh, as oscillation so the moment he the word heavens come he associates it with god and then he starts thinking what i am doing whether it is right or no and he understands because as i told you we all understand so there is a kind of repentance also but the moment he starts repenting he is unable to do that even because now he has given his soul away to lucifer mephistopheles pulls him back so this tug of war is going on in the mind of faustus again the good and the bad angel come and faustus asks mephistopheles here in this scene who made the world where mephistopheles refuses to answer him now this is at this point there is an interaction between lucifer and dr faustus and dr faustus asks lucifer about the seven deadly sins and lucifer tells him about the seven deadly sins which are pride pride we all know now there is a slight difference uh, not a slight but a major difference between something that you call as self respect and something that you call as pride you are also proud of your country you are proud of your indian cricket team you are proud of your college you are proud of your family that pride is different and when you limit your pride to include only yourself somewhere that degenerates you are limited and yet you are egoistic there in that i mean the pride that we are talking of deals with that okay the opposite will be to be very humble to reach out to people to be you know uh, you thank god for whatever you have and on the other hand you are proud that whatever you have achieved you alone have done it that kind of an egoism when it comes into you that is the first sin this is what lucifer tells dr faustus second is covetousness when you go on accumulating things more than what you actually need so there is a greed to have more and more maybe things to eat maybe something to wear uh, maybe your cars your houses all the materialistic things maybe the the footwear that you use maybe the accessories that you use what is enough where you should stop some people go on accumulating wealth after wealth that is being covetous so the covetousness is the second sin third is wrath and wrath is very close to anger 
but wrath is much more than anger and if you in in terms of degree if you uh, if you talk uh, wrath is a, a great great anger will be wrath so again the moment you are angry it is a kind of reaction to something okay uh, there can be other ways of dealing with those things also okay so wrath is also one of the deadly sins envy now envy jealousy envy is when you are feeling bad about what you don't have and somebody else has so there is a comparison you are doing between maybe two people more than two people something of that sort maybe there is you know because every man every uh, entity is different you have your pros you have your cons you cannot compare two people at all but then there are many things maybe in an organization when we are envious of the others success or maybe you know uh, they have something which you don't have which in the course of time you might have but then that distinction at that point of time it diminishes and you start feeling that you know the other person should not get it that envy has got that edge in it okay so that is also one of the sins gluttony gluttony is you know you go on eating a uh, great amount of things go on consuming many things that consumerism also comes into gluttony sloth i think majority of us are uh, you know we are a victim of this sloth is being lazy we are not we can be very skillful but actually putting in efforts putting in our 100% into doing things this is something i feel that majority of us don't put in our 100% into the work that we do if we do that success will definitely follow but somewhere uh, down the line we procrastinate we put uh, today's thing on tomorrow and then the whole pile it is too much for us to bear that so sloth is another sin and the the last one that is out of the seven sins what uh, lucifer tells dr fostus is lechery now lechery uh, like last lechery something which rightfully does not belong to you you lust after that you pine for what is not okay in terms of getting people uh, uh, who uh, actually uh, not out of love but out of a kind of a lust for that person when such kinds of you know your intention matters a lot if your intention is good in securing something then it is something which is respectable but the intention is wrong then that kind of a behavior is something which can be termed as sinful so this another wonderful uh, uh, you know whole a uh, whole scene is there where lucifer tells about all these seven deadly sins but then you know Uh, the moment the sins are told to dr fostus uh, dr fostus's mind is also diverted again now what does fostus do after getting immense power you know one would think that as i told you a small child if he gets a magical powers if he only has that magic wand and does this will at the most think of eating a cake or maybe some kind of you know going into uh, to play something or might get some uh, materialistic things this is quite you know when a, for a child or a young person to imagine all these things and want all these things is okay but for fostus getting immense power what does he do after that let us see now after he gets immense power the first thing that fostus does is he asks for a wife and when he asks for a wife to mephistopheles mephistopheles says no you can get n number of women but i cannot get you a wife because wife can be had only when you enter into the institution the sacred institution of marriage and with marriage comes a lot of responsibility it is a, as i told you it's a sacred union of two people so wherever something that is sacred it means blessed by god and here mephistopheles cannot do anything related to god so he says i cannot get you a wife okay but this is what fostus wants after he has immense power uh, when he gets the, when he reads the book of magic and gets power okay the second thing that he wants is he is very eager to see the monuments of the city of rome so he visits places okay one can understand this that you also you know you also are uh, very uh, travel thirsty and uh, after corona period i think uh, more so because uh, we were restricted we were limited at that point of time so now you know after that the whole travel and tourism industry was uh, it flourished 
okay because people wanted to see go and experience things so he also wanted to go and see all the monuments of the city of rome now the third thing that fosters does after getting mag uh, the the power of magic is he plays tricks on pope himself you know this is something you know which makes us think about fosters i mean playing tricks like what when you are invisible going and maybe uh, uh, slapping somebody or maybe you know snatching away their dishes so all this is childishness okay uh, small children are going to be um, greatly amused because of all these things okay but foster also does all these things he curses loudly he snatches dishes from the table he beats the friars uh, he flings fireworks everywhere and then he leaves so people are you know they feel as if some ghost has come or what because they cannot see anyone but all these things are happening so there is a kind of you know um uh, the the can uh, you know incantations are there by the friars that maybe some kind of ghostly spirit is around us and we need to drive away the ghost so they start incanting okay foster calls upon the spirit of alexander and his paramour and you know the lover of alexander and the scholars are also he's showing off he's showing off what he has and with the power that he has what all he can do now with this showing off what is it trying to prove is he using his power immense power that he has in into uh, maybe helping other people maybe actually uh, you know acquiring uh, knowledge which earlier he did not have or doing something good for the society nothing of that sort he is only showing off he you know the scholars are all they praise dr foster so oh, you can bring forth the uh, the soul of alexander and his lover that is a big thing according to them now there is a night at the emperor's court and when he enters into the emperor's court he has horns on his head now this is what fosters does and everybody you know is amused uh, and then again the knight is sent back and the horns are removed and all those things fosters even cheats the horse trainer by doing magic there is a whole sequence where he uh, sells his horse and then he says he tells the horse trainer that don't take the horse into uh, into the waters and all those things and uh, somehow uh, he you know he cheats him in the whole process uh, there is the scene where the duke and the duchess of vanholt are there and the duchess is pregnant and she uh, feels like eating grapes and all in its mid uh, winter period and they asked fosters to show his magic so they want him to bring uh, grapes for the duchess and uh, through the magic uh, fosters brings uh, grapes which are very sweet to taste and all and they praise him so he wants praise he wants recognition he wants appreciation for people and he wants to show off his knowledge this is what he does in the end he wants to meet the most beautiful woman that is helen of troy and uh, since she is no more her her spirit is called and uh, there's a famous passage is there this is the is this the face uh, you know the uh, the whole passage is so nicely uh, presented in dr foster's that he is fascinated with the beauty of helen but then this is an apparition we have to understand once a person dies can never come back it's only a spirit of that person who is brought back so in reality there is nothing okay then the next scene that happens is again the whole uh, uh, you know in the end the whole sequence is there where foster's the end nears all 24 years are spent and somehow the last hour comes where fosters goes on again oscillating in his mind that he has enjoyed all par he has enjoyed all things materialistic things and now the end has come and he feels chittery he feels like he should repent he despairs but then lucifer approaches him and at 12 at midnight the devils come and they carry away dr fosters he is damned forever because he has sold his soul to the devil now he can never come back there is no you know in the end there is a lot of uh, struggle that goes on in his mind he says for uh, he wants god to you know change the situation he wants earth to you know break and pull him inside you know instead of going into hell he wants to do anything else but not go into hell but this kind of a thing uh, comes to us at the 11th hour not before that 
when you know you have to pay back time that pay back time comes this is where we also feel the same thing so that remorse that repentance that everything that despair that sadness all this struggle happens in the end but then it's a tragedy dr faustus is taken away by the devil and here the play ends but now when you know uh, the end comes this is how it is uh, mentioned in uh, 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 in the last part of dr faustus and i have used certain lines over here uh, later on when you revisit this uh, uh, lecture you can read these lines very beautiful lines there are many uh, beautiful lines in the whole passage but i have to cover up uh, certain other things also and uh, before the time is up so i'll take you to the next part uh, we'll quickly discuss how this play now you have understood the whole uh, the setting of the play the uh, the theme of the play also how this can be termed as a renaissance play is this a typical renaissance play because these are the questions uh, which are usually asked uh, on based on dr foster's so uh, there is if you look at it you know in short if you want to um, summarize what you saw in dr foster's uh, you have a passionate pursuit of knowledge so such kind of passionate pursuit of knowledge was also there in the renaissance period there were people you know those who wanted to know more and more so you go behind knowledge but you know there are limitations to everything and we have to accept that medical science in today's world has in the 21st century has gone to the extent of having brain transplantations also but then in the 16th 17th century there was a limit to all these things the scientific temper has or the medical uh, sciences has slowly developed okay so there was a limitation and we have to accept the limitations we cannot go on craving for more things perhaps this is where the similarity lies the second point is you know you push the boundaries to gain more so that gaining somewhere when you are extremely greedy you want to have more instead of putting in your efforts into uh, you know uh, making the whole thing more meaningful you have a house you have a car instead of enjoying what you have if you go on craving for more pushing boundaries means you are going beyond your means maybe you go in for emis and you have one number of you know uh, uh, the the installment uh, things which are there because i want to enjoy things now when will i enjoy it why because i don't know whether there is life after death that big question again remains so whatever is there is now this eat drink and be merry kind of a concept which is there maybe that is also uh, somewhere uh, uh, inside this ambition so ambition and over ambition there is a thin line in between ambition to a large extent is a welcome trait but where it steps one step it takes away from this uh, good goal it takes you into the realm of over ambition and ambition to get what to get something you know something that we have termed as superhuman power you want to become god like becoming invisible and trying to do anything going anywhere eating anything indulging into materialistic things you are trying to become god you are trying to equate yourself with that super entity okay craving for material supremacy move towards secularism revolt against the established order and man versus god now these are the points uh, students which you uh, should explore when uh, we study dr foster's the play dr foster's on these lines if you try to equate them then you get the answer whether it is a renaissance play or not okay just yes these are some of the important questions which i think that we should all uh, uh, dwell upon we should all consider uh, the first one is comment upon marlowe's posters is a typical renaissance hero just now we had to talk about that explain how christopher marlowe's tragedy dr foster's can be termed as a morality play again while i was talking about dr foster's i hinted at uh, when you start with what morality play means and uh, you talk about the good and the bad angels and their role in uh, you know in n number of scenes and acts uh, these good and the bad angels come and they are personified uh, uh, qualities which actually uh, uh, you know hint at something 
to Dr. Faustus. Okay. So uh, there is a whole lot of, uh, uh, you know, good things that you can include over here in this answer. Uh, the third question which we are going to uh, talk about is why does Dr. Faustus sell his soul to Lucifer? Now there is why does he do that? So there is maybe, you know, pushing the boundaries kind of a thing. And uh, try to find the answers, try to uh, find the uh, the beautiful, uh, you know, quotations which are also there in the whole play and make use of these quotations in your answers. Then what are the terms of Faustus's agreement with Lucifer? This is a uh, that way a simple answer because um, uh, the terms and conditions were very simple. 24 years uh, of enjoyment, of immense power, of wealth of uh, status, of having anything and everything that he wished for. And at the end of it, he is ready to sell his soul also. Okay. Compare the master-servant relationship. Yes, here we are talking of Dr. Faustus and Wagner and how uh, the, the uh, you know, the master, uh, as the master behaves, the servant also behaves accordingly. Okay. Then the seven deadly sins, we just now had a talk about it. So uh, you'll have to describe the entire uh, uh, the the whole scene also and the seven deadly sins also. Now, what does Lucifer say? And the role of Mephistopheles in this is very important. Okay. Then comment upon Faustus's mental conflict from the beginning of the play to the end. Here somewhere, again, the, uh, the mental conflict that we are talking of is again the good and the ba bad angels coming together. Uh, all those things you can include. Okay. Write a uh, note uh, on the role of Mephistopheles and Dr. Faustus. So the character of Mephistopheles Again, there can be another question where you have to sketch the character of Dr. Faustus. Um, and um, there can be a number of smaller questions also. But these are some of the uh, basic questions which are uh, usually uh, dealt with in the university examination. So prepare yourself accordingly. And uh, uh, I request you to go back to the original text and the paraphrase of it. You can get a hold of it anywhere. Uh, you have any questions, you are free to ask me here on this platform. You can unmute yourself and ask me. Are there any questions, students? Okay. Uh, in the chat box, I am getting, thank you for, uh, okay, no questions are there. Uh, right. So, Bhavana, madam, over to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I Thank you very much. I finished it in, uh, in, the, in the time that was allotted to me. Yes, it's 7-7. Seven, seven. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. It was indeed an enlightening presentation an informa informative session for our students. It is said that uh, greed is a bottomless pit which uh, exhausts the person in an endless uh, effort to satisfy the need without ever reaching the satisfaction. And that's what we have seen in Dr. Foster's. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. So before we end our session, I would like to thank all the faculty members present here for their gracious presence. I would also like to thank our students for their patient listening. And lastly, on the special occasion of the Shara, may the light of knowledge dispel the darkness of ignorance and greed from our lives. Happy the Shara to all of you. Good thank night. you. And same to you. Very nicely put by you, Dr. Bhavna. And um, uh, the, the only thing that I can say in summing up is, uh, it is really not possible for anyone to finish Dr. Foster's in one hour's time. So I've just picked up the important points. Uh, this will actually set the pace. The students are requested to go back and uh, study on their own also. The pointers are there here. Okay, The teachers are here for you. Um, you can come back to ask and you can ask us questions also. But prepare your own answers. This is a, a very good opportunity that the, uh, the collaborating colleges have given to all the students as well as the faculty members to interact with the students. So thank you so much, everyone, the students also for such wonderful messages that they are putting in.